Good evening, and welcome to Hardfire. I'm Ronald Wick. Tonight we're bringing you another show uh, devoted to uh, the exploration of 9-11 conspiracy theories. We're going to concentrate on the collapse of World Trade Center 7. Uh, World Trade Center 7 is something of a stepchild among these theories because the building was not hit by a plane and it collapsed seven hours after the attacks. So we have two guests tonight who I think are uniquely qualified to discuss this subject. Uh, my first guest is Arthur Scheuermann. Arthur was uh, a member of the uh, New York City Fire Department for 20 years. He retired as a battalion chief. He's written a, a book on the collapse of the Twin Towers, Fire in the Skyscraper. It's available uh, through Amazon.com. Um, he also has a chapter on World Trade Center 7 in the book, and it's lavishly illustrated, well worth your attention. My other guest, uh, probably familiar to you, Mark Roberts, a 9-11 researcher extraordinaire. Mark has published numerous papers on various aspects of the uh, events of 9-11. Um, he has a, a paper specifically devoted to World Trade Center 7. It's entitled The Lies of the Truth Movement. He shows how quotes uh, are taken out of context and sometimes distorted grotesquely. But he will tell you more about that in the body of the show. I'd like to begin with uh, Arthur. I'm going to uh, read a quote from his paper on World Trade Center 7, and he talks about the establishment of a collapse zone. The anticipation of collapse was a brilliant conclusion, and no lives were lost when the 47-story building collapsed about an hour and a half after the evacuation order was given. The BBC somehow misheard the orders to evacuate the collapse zone and reported the building had collapsed well before it actually did. Now, uh, Arthur, it sounds to me like this is an extraordinary feat by the fire department to avoid any more loss of life on this terrible day. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Especially when you abandon a building and it's an uncontrolled fire, there is a possibility of collapse, no matter what kind of building it is, you know, if, if the fire is uh, bad enough. And uh, the collapse zone is was like, how many feet was it? About 600 feet, just Six, about the height of the building. Yeah. 600 feet, which was included buildings around that. So they had to evacuate other buildings. They had to evacuate everybody out of the, out of the street. So it was a big thing just to getting everybody evacuated. And, uh, but it's standard procedure. If you're abandoning a building and it's on fire. Now might... that's what I wanted to touch on when you say it's standard procedure. The fire department deals with probabilities rather than certainties. In other words, when they decide that a building is unstable and liable to collapse, they don't know that it's going to collapse. They're just making a professional judgment. Right, absolutely. Okay. Now, that's, that's a point that you've touched on a number of times. I, I remember in our debates with Jim Fetzer, you, you were also talking about that. How do you construct any sort of conspiracy theory regarding the collapse of World Trade Center 7 that doesn't entail complicity on the part of the fire department? Yeah, this is something that, that the conspiracists just don't seem to get, although I've tried to drill it in many times in person. The very first time I faced any of them in person, uh, Les Jamison, the head of uh, New York 9-11 Truth, was claiming that the fire department got this word from above. Well, from above who? Uh, and he said, oh, oh uh, you know, the, the commissioner must have known, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, the bottom line is that the people on the ground, the people who were making those decisions, uh, weren't conferring with anyone else, nor did they take orders from anybody else. Uh, and I'm sure Arthur will back me up on that. that right. That the chief in charge of the building is in total charge of that building. He can evacuate it or do anything he wants with it. That's his responsibility. Yeah. So I've spent... They've spent a lot of time trying to take quotes out of context. I've spent, in, in that paper in particular, uh, lots of time putting them back in context and saying, this is what all the people who were there fighting that fire and determining the safety of the building think. And there are no dissenters. No one there uh, from any level uh, said that that was a bad idea to pull people away, said that they didn't think the building was going to collapse. Um, and in fact, there were people like demolition experts who were there who had come down after the towers collapsed who said we were absolutely sure the building was going to collapse um, because of the severity of the fires and the amount of the damage. So they're unanimous in that. No, they didn't know exactly when, but what was the prudent thing to do, to, to take people away from the building? 
and, and thank God they did. Uh, uh, potentially saved a lot of lives by doing that. And guys didn't want to leave the pile either. They didn't want to leave uh, the search for their, for their fallen and buried brothers there. So it took hours to get everybody away from that. See, I, I find it extraordinary that anyone could claim foreknowledge, anyone could claim complicity, when 343 firefighters lost their lives. I, I mean, yeah. it doesn't where, really where, make sense. Yeah, if, if, if they were warned to get by somebody to get away from Building 7 for some reason, and it wasn't the fire department's decision, why weren't they warned about the towers if the towers were supposedly blown up? And they lost a good deal of their leadership, the FDNY's yeah. leadership. The Chief Gansey died there. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Fian died there. Chief Downey's safety chief died there. Uh, they lost hundreds of years worth of, of fire department leadership, and yet they're, the same people are warned that Building 7 is going to come down? That doesn't make any sense to me. Before we let Arthur describe um, the structure of World Trade Center 7, um, I want to lay, a re lay to rest a canard that's been floating around for years, and every time you think that it's dead, it resurfaces. You use the magic word, pull. Now, Larry Silverstein said to a fire chief, uh, in view of the tremendous loss of life, maybe the smartest thing to do would be to pull it. Uh, rational people understand him. He meant to uh, get these men out of harm's way. They're in a dangerous environment, an unstable building. Let's pull the contingent out. Well, I think the chief probably told Silverstein, we want to pull our men out. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't asking have any for reason, permission. Though. Is it anybody in there? Do we ha you have any reason why we shouldn't? Yeah. I mean, he certainly wouldn't be asking the owner of the building for permission to pull them out. Yeah, right. Yeah, now, this, this phrase, pull it, uh, conspiracy theorists keep saying that it means blow up the building and that it's industry slang. <laughs> but it's not. No. Uh, I mean, I have personally called 20 demolition companies. They all agree that pull it does not mean blow up the building. There is a specific use for the term involving uh, cables, attaching cables to a small structure and literally pulling it off its center of gravity. But it's, it's time to put this one to bed. If you have Silverstein saying there's been a tremendous loss of life, the smartest thing to do would be blow up the building, He's not making any sense, and he's making this request to a firefighter. Nor would he know demolition terminology. There's nothing about it. And, and plus the fact that he's supposedly saying this to a national audience on, on television. Hey, here's my billion-dollar crime that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, his insurance company didn't have a problem with that statement. They paid $861 million on, that, on the WTC-7 claim. Well, he's so, lucky Larry now. He did yeah, lose if, a lot of money, so if, how lucky if is he, that? Yeah, if he were confessing to this crime, you'd think that the insurance company, they're not exactly known for paying out real easily, uh, mm -hmm. would have said, maybe we shouldn't pay that $861 million until we look into this a bit farther. But no, that, it, it's just the whole thing is absurd. It just makes no sense whatsoever. Arthur, you have described uh, the nuts and bolts of the collapse of the, uh, of the building. Uh, start off by telling us if, in your opinion, this building met standards, safety standards, that have been approved for skyscrapers. Do you, do you think this was a safe building? No, I don't, I don't think it was because, number one, the span of the beams was like 53 feet. Mm -hmm. When they test a floor assembly, they test 17 foot maximum. So there's no way that they could know that something that was probably twice the, the span would be safe under, this, under fire conditions because they only test them at 17 feet. That's, that's the standard. Now, why, why was it approved? I mean, why were they able to... Uh, well, it was the standard. The Port Authority has a uh, say over what they build. They, they had, they're not responsible for any codes, and uh, they developed the codes for this building when they were building the towers. So there's a lot of similarities in the buildings. The core had no lateral support, which is normal to have diagonals in the core. So all the core columns, if, if they were pushed out of, out of alignment too far, they would collapse. Um, the spans, I say, were too long. Um, there were a, lo a lot of other things that I could mention, like the, the stairways were probably enclosed in, in sheetrock instead of uh, hardened that, to protect it against uh, any uh, damage. Uh, 
there was a, a lot of uh, deficiencies. Now, you make an interesting point in your paper. We, we understand that uh, Building 7 was impacted by large pieces of debris from the North Tower that created a 10-story gash in the south side. You made the point that the fires alone could have brought about the collapse of Building 7. Right. So in other words, you think that the, uh, the debris itself was perhaps not the, the main problem here. Well, that's my opinion from, from studying it. And uh, I mean, they have to do further tests on this. They have to do computer analyses and uh, they have to even maybe do some long span floor testing, you know, some actual 60 foot long span floors. Mm. Uh, but but that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's what NIST, we should point out that, that there is going to be an, an official report that's, that they're working on now uh, and have been working on for a few years. Still in the summer. National Institute of Standards and Technologies. They had an interim report in, in uh, June of 2004, but have learned a lot since then. And um, they don't even have a, uh, uh, in a couple of months, they'll have their final hypothesis uh, out. So when we're talking about what did happen to the building, according to them, we're not quite sure yet what their final version is going to be, but they're saying that they're um, not really including the damage to the building as a main cause of collapse. They're just considering the fires, and they're just considering, uh, which is fairly new information, they're just considering that it was not fed by the uh, diesel oil, uh, pressurized oil lines uh, that were in the building, which was something that everyone had talked about uh, quite a bit, that that could have been a cause of, of why the fires were so severe. But they're saying that, well, the fires were basically normal office fires. Um, and uh, going under that assumption, the uh, building still could have uh, and did collapse. Now, that's pretty much what you're saying. Well, they also did some preliminary studies, and they found that if one column on the long span side of this building went out, the entire set of floors up to the roof would collapse. And uh, that is definitely not according to city code, because the city code states that if one column is removed, the other columns have to take up the load. And uh, I think it was the floors that sagged and, and pulled the column out of alignment. Now and you describe the penthouse, the, the east penthouse caves in and pulls the west penthouse along with it, creating that distinctive kink well, that we see in the photo. It wasn't the east penthouse that pulled it. It was all the floors. Well, I mean, so the that, floors that's, that happened from, yeah. the from the bottom, near the bottom, okay. anyway. Yeah. So it didn't, people see the, the first real visible sign of the collapse is the east penthouse. And we're talking about a huge structure, mechanical penthouse. This isn't where Larry Silverstein lived, as, as I've seen conspiracists yes, say. Yes, yes. Uh, a huge structure, the size of several apartment buildings on my block. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that descend into the into the roof line first. Mm -hmm. uh, but what was happening is is down below, uh, the uh, floors had had uh, had given way. Columns had had lost their support mm -hmm. and collapsed. So you can see this sort of rippling effect going up the building. Now you uh, said it's like it started happened. like on the fifth floor. Uh, it could have started on the the uh, twelfth floor or the eighth floor. Mm -hmm. I don't know which, but when all the floors lost the support of that of that column or those columns they're, they're still attached together the floors now if they go down they're pulling on the outside walls and and the core columns because they go into suspension it's just like a, a cable in suspension they're pulling on the core columns and that's what collapsed the core columns and then you saw the the west roof go in the west uh, penthouse go in because the entire core failed. Once the core failed, everything goes down. The last thing to fall was the outside frame, which was probably pretty strong because it came down as, as a unit. It was, was collapsed by the time the outside frame That's a down. good point. One of the things that the conspiracists say is a sign of a controlled demolition is that the building fell pretty much straight down. I think we all agree that it did fall pretty straight I down. I was just going to ask you about that. I mean, it was all over Barclay Street, and then it did heavy damage to 30 Washington. A so lot of that, a, a lot of that, pile, though, yeah, it wasn't a neat pile, certainly. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 uh, just, um, it destroyed a building that's being torn down right now, mm -hmm. uh, 30 West Broadway. Uh, but the start of the collapse, yes, it's pretty much vertical. Uh, but what's happening is the collapse starts in the interior, center interior of the building. It's a huge building. It's almost 100 meters on the north side, uh, 186 feet uh, in depth. And um, 
And when you have a failure in the center of that, how else is the building going to collapse? Uh, uh, people are saying that, oh, it should have been, because uh, there was damage on the south side from the, from the collapse of the North Tower, that it should have toppled over that way. Well, no. If the columns are all still in good shape, most of the columns are in good shape, the core columns are still in good shape, um, uh, then it's not going to topple over. But if the failure happens where the core columns are, it's going to fall straight down. Doesn't it irritate you to continue to read in, in 2008 uh, that there were no significant fires and uh. hardly any damage to the facade of the building? I mean, why, why would you be satisfied with that explanation when it's demonstrably untrue? Right, there was a very serious fire on the uh, 12th floor, I believe, mm -hmm. and it covered practically half the building. Yeah, you, you have photos. Yeah, I mean, I can see, you can see fire out eight windows on one side, on the east side of the building, and there was fire showing on the north side out a couple of windows. Now, when, when the fire department decides that um, the fire is too severe to warrant risking men's lives, what are we talking about? I mean, how bad a fire is that when they say, we, we don't think we can handle this, we're just right. going to pull our men out? Well, that they, had, they had a problem with water supply. If you don't have water, you can't put the fire. Yeah, they didn't have pressure. Didn't have water yeah, pressure. They didn't have water pressure. So there was, uh, it was a, you know, fait accompli. They couldn't, they couldn't do anything. So you have a building so that's had heavily pull. damaged by debris that has extremely severe fires raging, and you have no water to fight the fires, and people are wondering, why did this building fall down? There's a really good comparison that 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 conspiracists need to look into, and I cover this in my paper a little bit, which is uh, between Building 7 and uh, 90 West Street, which is just on the opposite side of the World Trade Center site. Uh, was also hit by quite a bit of debris, uh, had very severe fires in it, and burned for, for parts of two days. Um, now, why didn't that building collapse? Well, that building, a beautiful uh, office building, designed by Cass Gilbert, great architect, uh, was built in 1907, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, Old style of construction. Columns are close together, short span beams, but most importantly, uh, the fireproofing that was attached to all that steel. Uh, steel has to be fireproofed or it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail eventually in a fire, no matter how thick it is. Um, very thick uh, cement and terracotta fireproofing. That's how they built them in those days. Expensive to build, takes up a lot of room. You don't have a lot of office space when you build like that. Um, but very little structural damage to that building from the very severe fires that happened. So compare that to the spray-on fireproofing that was in Building 7 um, that doesn't take a blow very well. Uh, if there's, and you can see in some of the other buildings that, weren't, that didn't collapse that were hit by debris, fireproofing is knocked right off of, those, off of those beams. I was in Building 7 when they were constructing it, and I went to check to see how the fireproofing was. It's better than it used to be because they're using fireproofing that's five times uh, more durable than, than it's required by code. But the code, as Arthur, I think, will say in, in 1968 or so, uh, did not require very substantial or very durable fireproofing. Oh, Arthur, you, you, uh, I think you're corroborating in your paper what Mark is saying. You talk about the great floor space in this building. Yeah. I, is this a trade-off? Uh, more floor space, less safety? Uh, absolutely, because number one, they take the columns out because uh, they want free floor space for the office workers. And uh, they want views out the window for everybody in the office. So they, they take the walls out, the fire walls out. Hmm. So in the old buildings, they had a limit to the size of, a, of an area that was enclosed by firewalls. In these buildings, they were just, some of the floors were completely open. So a fire could start on one end and travel all the way around the, the floor. Now, we, we have to talk about controlled demolition because this is, after all, the reason for these conspiracy theories. If no one blew up the building, then what are we talking about? Uh, wouldn't the fire department, having watched a building come down, inquire if it might have been blown up? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't they look for <laughs> some evidence Absol of a... Con absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it again defies belief that people will accuse the fire department of neglecting to check for explosives. <laughs> uh, also, if you use explosives, there's characteristic tears in the steel. It, 
you can tell right away if explosives have, have been used. You know? I'm glad you raised this point. When you say you can tell right away, in other words, experienced firefighters aren't scratching their heads saying, gee, I wonder if this could have been a demolition. I mean, they, they're looking for something specific and they're not finding it at World Trade Center 7. Well, and the other things that, that anyone can tell that didn't happen were a huge detonation, which you have to have in, yeah. in an explosion. Uh, uh, I've got a video online called uh, WTC Not a Demolition uh, that compares actual demolitions and what they sound and look like to what the World Trade Center buildings uh, sounded and looked like. Uh, in none of the buildings was there anything remotely like a these enormous charges, even from a small amount of, uh, of demolition charges. And, and these buildings, you need a fairly substantial amount because these are very heavy oh, columns. A 47 story building, um, yeah. Was a even if you only wanted to take a few columns out, uh, they're, they're huge columns and you don't have a chance to prepare them ahead of time like a demolitions team would. Uh, enormous blasts, unmistakable, louder, much louder than the collapses would be. Windows would be blown out. The smoke that's, that's uh, coming out of these open windows would be pushed out. You'd see that ejected. None of that happened. Well, they keep talking about the squibs. Now, it's, it's an issue that even Richard Gage, as bad as, as he is of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, as, as completely incompetent as he is, has actually dropped. Uh, he said that uh, people were saying that at the very top of the building in some of the videos you can see some, some ejections of dust that come out. Well, that was open. It had been hit by debris. It was open to the air. Smoke was pouring out. And why would you put demolition charges at the very top of the building anyway? It makes no sense well, at we, all. We, the fact that they were going upward me, means to me that the floors were pulling out in that corner. Oh, sure. From the bottom up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even, even he has dropped that claim. Uh, so hopefully we won't hear much more about that. Can you think of some particularly egregious examples of members of the truth movement distorting the words of firefighters on the scene? Oh, sure. Uh, Richard Gage, again, uh, on his website, uh, it says that one of the signs of controlled demolition is foreknowledge. Well, of course, if you're going to blow up a building, people have to know about that. But they're applying that to the World Trade Center buildings and to Building 7. So um, the, his idea is that uh, since the fire department says that they, they felt the building was going to come down, that's a sign of controlled de demolition, completely ignoring the fact that many people there actually uh, took a look at the building, were inside the building, outside the building, it was groaning, it's creaking, it's got these enormous uncontrollable fires in it, and made that determination. Uh, and to him, oh no, that's actually a sign of controlled demolition. Yeah, in other words, a professional you judgment. You can't possibly of, yeah. twist someone's, someone's uh, observation, determination, and words more than that. You can't mm. be more wrong than that. Uh, and it's unbelievably reprehensible that, that someone, and a professional too, in the building trades, would do that. Unbelievable. Now would be a good time to point out that, you know, here we are talking among ourselves. We did invite representatives of the truth movement. Um, nobody wants to face a real retired battalion chief. Nobody wants to face Mark Roberts. Uh, we would like to have an opponent for these gentlemen, but we couldn't find one. There are a few people who would do it, some of the no-planers and things like that, but they don't, they don't have a constituency as far as I can see. Yeah. They, they, they're very vocal, but I have a policy of not, of not engaging with them. Yeah, I, I think it would be appropriate for someone who's trying to sell a book or a DVD to have the, uh, the good taste to defend his, his position in an open debate. They seem uh, to think that these questions that we ask are too hard of them. Well, or, if they're, or, if they're, unfair. If they're, or unfair. If they're claiming, if they're going to make these incredible claims, they ought to be, have something to back it up with. And I don't think that we ask anything that's unreasonable. Arthur, as a, a, a retired firefighter, have you had any personal dealings with, uh, with people from the truth movement, people who... No, except on the internet. Yeah. I read some of them, but... Oh, but do, do you get accused oh, yeah, of complicity? Oh, yeah. I went to one of uh, Gage's uh, lectures, uh -huh. and it was practically everything he said was questionable. <laughs> it was yeah. like, I, kept, I had my hand up the entire time. <laughs> And uh, he didn't want to even look at me. You know? Yeah, it, it seems funny, though, that here you are promoting a, a great truth that you claim is being suppressed, and you don't take the opportunity to advance your cause. I, the, the, I think the big problem is that they don't have any hypothesis that they're trying to advance. It's just anomalies here that they perceive here and there. And when we ask them, how does this fit in, like we would, how does this Building 7 fit in to any 
any conspiracy theory that you have. That's the problem. Um, there's, there's simply no way to it. fit this square peg into a round hole. Yeah. I mean, where, where does Larry Silverstein suddenly enter the picture? Here he is barging in the, you know, this impossibly vast conspiracy is trying to conquer the world for Har Halliburton, and now Larry Silverstein is running an insurance <laughs> scam. And, <laughs> the, and, he's, and the fire department's in on it. And the, somehow the fire department's in on this. It's, uh, I don't know, Arthur. Uh, did you know any of the uh, any of the uh, heroes uh, who lost their lives? Did you? Oh uh, yeah, you, yeah, sure. You, oh, so this is rather a personal discussion, as far as you're concerned. Yeah, this is right. not something that you can make light of, you know. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But also, in fighting for building safety, skyscrapers need to be safer. And Arthur's book is yeah, that's my, that out. my main point of the book is to upgrade the codes. You're looking forward because, to the next. Uh, we had good codes in 1938. In 78, they changed the codes. They lowered all the standards, all the uh, four-hour war was, became a three-hour war. Why was that done? Well, the real, uh, real estate, estate industry <laughs> yeah. got, somehow got control of the codes and uh, changed them. It's very easy. You, you go to the, uh, the powers that be in the city and, look, we'd like to change this. You know, here's, a, here's some money. Uh, they want more rentable office space. Hmm. So, World Trade Center 7 is going to be rebuilt. It's going to be... Well, has been rebuilt. Has yeah. Been. I mean, is it going to be safer? Uh, uh, it, it ought to be. It's got, a, it's got a concrete core. Yeah, it is. Uh, it doesn't have this wallboard core. Oh, Chris, Chris DeFerro will be delighted. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, much better fireproofing, much better life and safety systems, uh, wider stairwells for people to get out and firefighters to get in, um, all of the... All of the um, uh, firefighting systems inside are protected inside that concrete core. But still, uh, the Port Authority is not not required to follow the codes. I mean, they, they, they did it to, on they their own. They agree to, yeah, uh, but they're they, not required they agree to. to. But they're not they're required actually to. Not. So it'll be so interesting. The code, the code is simply a guideline, then. It's not has no binding for the Port Authority, which is a really sort uh. of strange uh, organization uh, that what they're allowed to do and what they're not. Now, the new buildings that are going to be there. Uh, are going to have a lot of these same life safety systems and all, uh, but again, they're not required, still not required to, to abide by the codes. They've agreed to, but they're not required to. Well, again, we've come to the end of another hard fire discussion. I thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to thank my two guests, Arthur Scheuermann, thank you. Mark Roberts. It's been a pleasure having both of you gentlemen. We look forward to seeing you again on another edition of Hard Fire. Thank you. I'm Ronald Wick. Good night. Hard Fire is funded in part by the Libertarian Party of New York, www.ny.lp.org. Catering for the cast and crew of Hard Fire is generously provided by Da Vincenzo Restaurant, 256 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215, 718-369-3590, www.davincenzorestaurant.com.